Thank you so much. Uh, it's such an incredible honor to see this film before it premieres, but for capturing such powerful voices, Marty, and telling this story. But I, I want to start actually with Ambassador Ahmani, whom you all saw in the film. And the film ended with the stories of young women who'd been featured and what they lost. And Ambassador Rahmani, I think it's so important for you to tell the audience what's been lost for the young women of Afghanistan and really put that in perspective. Hello, good evening to everybody. It is such an honor and pleasure uh, to be joining you, unfortunately, virtually, but still it's a, a great privilege uh, to join you uh, through the through technology, which has made it thankfully available. Uh, what has been lost uh, for Afghan women at this point in time, everything. They uh, are the one, in fact, that they have lost the most, and they are the one that could bring real and sustainable change uh, to the country. Um, so to name a few, since the takeover of the Taliban, over 35 edicts has been issued that is specifically trying to limit women's rights and their access to, uh, to those rights and opportunities. Afghanistan is the only country in the world that prohibits girls from going to school beyond sixth grade. There is even whispers of that may drop to the third grade. It is a country that does not allow women to study, uh, to work, to, have, to seek employment, to even choose what they wear, the color of their outfit. So I don't know uh, what kind of oppression uh, or uh, any name would justify this kind of oppression. Mm -hmm. And you, we talk in the, the film, it has you know, some clear questions about what went wrong and why. And I want to turn to you, Colonel Dempsey. You mentioned we failed the Afghans. You at some point also point out that in an effort to try to do everything, we were unable to do the basic mission mm -hmm. we were there to do. What went wrong in your view? So for one, I think it's a, well, for one, first of all, thank you to everyone who's, who was a part of this, and thank you to the, you know, the reporters and documentarians who are forcing us to confront uh, this failure, because uh, the American tendency is to move on. <clears throat> Most of us have already moved on, uh, and I don't think we can avoid repetition. Like, I was a child of Vietnam. Uh, my father was a Vietnam veteran, and it used to always stun me how poorly we lost, and I thought we had learned, but we had not. Uh, and now what I see uh, in the public and in our policymaking circles is that we're not learning from this war either. We've all quickly moved on and only engage in so much as we gain short-term uh, partisan points. And we're not looking deeply uh, at the issues that led to failure because it wasn't an overnight failure. Uh, I like the quote from Doug Lute there that it was, you know, the, the seeds of failure were laid at least 15 years ago. Um, and one of the things I would caution folks against, and that you hear a lot, is that the Afghans just didn't want it. I don't think there's a single ISAF commander who has not said that at some point. I heard General Nicholson say it within the last month at the Council on Foreign Relations that, well, maybe the Afghans just didn't want it. <clears throat> and I want to be very clear that the only way to interpret that statement, given that we drove the plan and the policy and that we set up the military, the only way to interpret that statement that the Afghans didn't want it is our plan for Afghanistan would have worked perfectly if only Afghanistan were a different country. And so that has to be hit home again and again and again because we set up the military that collapsed like a house of cards. Uh, and to your question there about wanting everything and getting nothing, uh, part of that's not just on the military, it's also on the American public. Uh, it's on a disinterested public uh, that says, well, they've got it. Uh, and if they say they're building democracy, then sure, the military can probably do that. Uh, and it's that lack of scrutiny 
that allowed the American military to operate adrift for nearly 20 years to spend trillions of your taxpayer dollars in immensely wasteful ways and ultimately to lose the political battle uh, to a bunch of dudes with AKs and tennis shoes. Mm. But there was, there was a lot of scrutiny, particularly if we, if we go back to 2014 mm -hmm. and we look at that drawdown. And at that point, there were investigations after investigations into the corruption, mismanagement. John Sopko, the Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction, you know, had issued a multitude of reports. Investigative journalists had, there may have been a war-weary public, mm -hmm. but there was no shortage of report it, reporting on civilian casualties. What was the missing link? No one ever questioned the military plan. <clears throat> and there was an interesting uh, quote here in the documentary in this third hour, where if you heard the commander of Afghan Special Forces, he said, hey, uh, once we lose the laser-guided bombs in our Air Force, we're gonna be in a lot of trouble. And so the question I always ask is, how many laser-guided bombs and attack helicopters did the Taliban employ over the course of the 20-year war? There's a great quote uh, from uh, a South Korean officer post-Vietnam where he says, um, we were poor men, but they taught us to fight like rich men. Mm. We did that again, and we built a military based on us because it was the easy button. We built a military that looked like the American military without thinking about, well, what does it mean to sustain the American military? Educated public, effective bureaucracies, lack of corruption, lack of sectarian conflict, faith in a central government. We didn't take any, the lack of any of that into account, but the American military said, we're gonna build something that looks like us, and not only is it gonna be divorced from uh, Afghan politics, but the way we fund it is actually gonna undercut their legitimacy. Right? We're going to take guys who don't speak the language and put them way out. And so when time gets tough, they can say, you know what? I'm not sure what I'm fighting for. I don't even speak the language here. I'm out. But we, the American military, insisted that was the way to go. And we handcuffed the Afghans to the helicopters, to the laser-guided bombs, uh, in such a way that they couldn't operate without it, and they lost the force with none of that. Mm -hmm. Marty, I will be coming to you in just a moment, but I, I want to take the same question back to Ambassador Rahmani. Where do you think things went wrong? Um, I agree uh, with what was said in terms of uh, what went wrong really started a long time ago. For me, it started in 2010. I vividly, vividly remember when the announcement of withdrawal happened at the time. When, for the first time, when President Obama announced that uh, the full withdrawal of the troops uh, based on a time schedule, it was already that sense of chaos, very much felt back on the ground. There, the remedy to that was conferences, international conferences at the region, in, the Kab in Kabul, in another capital, just to say, oh, so what do we do now? And then on the other hand, not only the way the, the army was made up the way uh, that was described, it was also made out of the former fighters. The, uh, in other words, the former Mujahideen mm -hmm. who were engaged in several wars and before that in the, in, uh, during the Cold War with the Soviets. So there was this army of people who knew nothing but fighting that had transitioned from uh, being a soldier to commander and then from uh, that uh, at times drug lords, warlords, money lords, you name it. So there were many of these becoming big lords. At the time that they learned that the international troops are withdrawing, they knew very well what's going to happen. So a lot of, and not to blame all of it, but the seeds of deterioration, corruption, the failures of the institution that, that were basically just starting to, to uh, brew already started to decline. That's, that's, that's one thing. Another thing was the lack of a clear, consistent policy. 
Afghanistan was defined as a war, as a security issue. When it is a security issue and you define it with the word war, then what's the meaning of winning? And that meaning of win winning, from what I had seen, for the international community continuously and consistently changed. It had a different meaning at different times. Mm -hmm. For Afghans, it was survival for ordinary Afghans, for yeah. ordinary citizens. For those with power, it had a different meaning. Yeah. So, and then when, when the idea of peace was introduced, it was also not something that meant the same thing for um, all stakeholders. It, mm -hmm. it had a different meaning depending who you were talking to. Marty, so, mm -hmm. lack, of, lack of consistency, lack of policies uh, were the biggest issues. And then on the other hand, who did you have? A group of people with very uh, sharp, concise, and consistent message. Marty, you've interviewed countless experts. You've spent incredible time in the country over the last 20 years, returning again and again. You know, we see many of those experts in this film, and you've heard a multitude of views. What do you think are some of the primary, if you had to boil it down to three primary issues, what went wrong? Well, I think the, the, the entire war was botched from the get-go. Um, and, and that's what the, the series shows. Um, it, it begins with us toppling the Taliban and then quickly taking our eye off the ball mm -hmm. and going to Iraq, thinking that, uh, I mean, I think it was Rumsfeld that said you, there was nothing more left to bomb. Um, and so we had to move on, and we did. Um, and it wasn't really until Obama's surge under the uh, leadership of General Petraeus that the war was really engaged in. And then it was engaged uh, with this theory that we could somehow win hearts and minds applying counterinsurgency uh, in the country, which was a, uh, you know, already um, there were serious questions about how that worked out in Vietnam, but yet we, we strode forward. Um, that was a botched operation. And then as we started to draw down troops and depend more on uh, small teams of, you know, hit squads basically, uh, kill capture mm -hmm. was the name of the policy informally, um, we started hitting the wrong targets. And if, if, uh, if you look at the whole sweep of the series, you just see one um, you know, gross failure of U.S. Uh, military policy. Then another problem, I think, that should be raised here, and that is that we not only, we under-resourced the war in Afghanistan on all levels, political uh, as well as military, and then we over-resourced it. And what happens if you pour billions of dollars into a country with a nascent uh, government? You have corruption. Uh, we employed warlords. We, we, rose, uh, we raised these people up uh, mm -hmm. to run the country. So uh, that was botched there. And, and what you see in this uh, unraveling is that by the time we get to Trump, we're just eager to get out. Uh, any kind of deal we can get. I mean, it's incredible to me that Halilzad answered my question about being soft on the Taliban by saying, no, we got what we wanted. We wanted out, we got out. Um, so we, we were rushing to the exits, and Biden, who had always opposed the war from back in the time when he was vice president, agrees with it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it's not, I think there's a confusion when he is saying um, that you know, it was time to get out, therefore it was a good idea. He's not incorporating the idea that this was a botched operation, the whole lack of planning and everything else. So I don't know if I've asked, mm -hmm. answered your question, yeah. but it was just one um, terrible mm -hmm. um, disaster over 20 years, one after the other. I want to ask about the role of Pakistan, which has played certainly a role in this war. And uh, I want to bring up something that Ambassador Ryan Crocker recounted in a conversation um, that he had with the head of Pakistan's intelligence agency, uh, Lieutenant General Ashfaq Kayani. This was recounted in the book, The Afghanistan Papers. And he says that the ISI chief in Pakistan at the time told him, I know you think we're hedging our bets 
You're right, we are, because one day you'll be gone again. He's referencing the time at the Russians. You'll be done with us, but we're still going to be here because we can't actually move the country. And the last thing we want with all our other problems is to have turned the Taliban into a mortal enemy. So yes, we're hedging our bets. What role did Pakistan play? I'll ask you. Overstated um, in terms of its military impact. And you know we, we're all enamored with this theory of counterinsurgency, uh, which really is a fairly simplistic um, boiling down and puts in military terms government legitimacy. Uh, not to get too nerdy on it, but we threw away all these arguments about government legitimacy and decades of research of what we know to be true. And we said, well, we got this new theory. It's called counterinsurgency. It's based on maybe a handful of cases. Anybody who does science, uh, you know, you, it's hard to make generalizations over a handful of cases, but we did. And one of the go-to excuses we always said was, well, we've never defeated an insurgency where there's been a nearby sanctuary. And I said, okay, that's great, but let's take that in context. And I would ask anyone here, you know, I've walked every pass uh, between Pakistan and Afghanistan, at least in Kunar and most of uh, Host and Paktika. It's hard. It's not easy. And so I would challenge any military leader who brings that up as an excuse for why we lost mm -hmm. to say, would you rather have uh, what could be smuggled in on the occasional truck or on the backs of donkeys uh, over these really grueling mountain passes that are under constant surveillance uh, by American aircraft? Or would you like the trillions upon trillions of dollars of weapons, ammunition, and personnel that we freely flew in to Bagram, that we freely brought in via train through Pakistan uh, and convoys, mountains upon mountains upon mountains of equipment? There is no competition. And so when we talk about things like safe havens, we're giving an excuse, we're allowing ourselves to take that ball, which is it's about political legitimacy. And the Taliban were able, in ones and twos, to walk across those mountain passes, talk to their neighbors, their relatives, their friends, and win battle for political legitimacy versus what we were trying to get through brute force and the mountains of men and material we were using to arm the forces. Mm. Um, Ambassador Rahmani, I was in southern Afghanistan in late 2021 after the fall, and I was able to get to places I'd previously been unable to go, um, places that had been overrun by the Taliban. And, you know, in one particular area, I stumbled into a graveyard that had the names of, you know, what were considered to be martyrs. Their gravestones were marked with the cities and towns where these fighters had come from, and they listed Pakistani cities, Faridkot, uh, Karachi, Kuwaita, um, there is no doubt that Pakistani fighters made their way into the country, but in your view, how much of a role did Pakistan play? I believe Pakistan played uh, quite a significant role all along. There is uh, a lot of different theories and disputes in terms of the origin of uh, Taliban. Were they the group that, that really uh, uh, homogeneously were homegrown and uh, retaliated to the corruption and the, and the issues that, that uh, uh, were at the time present because of the civil war and the, Mujahideen, the former Mujahideen uh, fighting with one another, or they were really trained and exported to Afghanistan. These are real two different potent theories to begin with. So, so the role has have been quite significant. The support that they had, the training that they had, the, the safe haven that they had, that's that can never be overlooked and neglected. Uh, the, the bigger picture issue, the way I see it, is the fact that Pakistan, uh, leading this uh, and all, many other uh, regional countries also subscribing to that, is their relationship vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan simply as a security issue, an only security issue. And uh, they have never been able to look at this uh, relationship otherwise. And as, as a result, every bit, uh, two bits of the re, uh, different parts of the region you pick, they would have an issue with another one, and, and they would have a representative or a proxies uh, in Afghanistan, one way or another, fighting. And, and they, they use uh, that as a buffer zone, as an insulator, and, and whatnot. But uh, Pakistan in particular, given its role uh, during the Cold War, 
and, and uh, the significant role they play, uh, they, uh, I, I believe they, they had a massive role uh, again during the past, uh, the, during the 20 years of intervention and of the US and uh, its allies intervention in Afghanistan. And they did uh, have a, a huge role in how things unfolded. Mm-hmm. So, in the same town that I was just mentioning, in southern Kandahar, I was in Bande Timor, this area, it's a desert area that borders, um, it's between Kandahar and Helmand provinces. And in these same areas, I also, you know, did a sample of households to see how many civilians were killed um, in, in a single village. And on average, every household lost about five civilian family members, the majority of them to airstrikes and night raids. Night raids carried out primarily by Afghan forces, often with US support in these areas where they would pick up men, almost men from every single household. And many of these men were then charged bribes for their release. So they would run when these night raids happened and then would sometimes be killed in airstrikes when they ran. And None of these families had death certificates from the central government. They were far too cut off from it. It's very remote. It's hard to reach. Their deaths are not recorded in official statistics. They never met the barometer required for the United Nations to count them in their count in in terms of the number of sources that were required. My reporting and the reporting of countless others has shown that there have been far more civilian casualties as a result of this war than we are familiar with. And there are obviously many. We've seen in the film, if you watch part two, um, you know, there are there have been deliberate attacks by the Taliban on civilians. They've killed scores of civilians. There's no doubt about that. But what role did civilian casualties really play in the undoing of this war? <laughs> I'll start with I'll start with you, Marty. Well, I think actually uh, Dr. Dempsey here should speak to this because he um, has a moment in part two, which is focused on the killing of civilians by U.S. airstrikes, drone attacks, uh, night raids, uh, and whatnot. Um, But you make a point, very, um, uh, very salient point, that the government likes to say, well, only 2% of these attacks went, went awry. And uh, you picked that up and and made the point that uh, uh, you can weave quite a few stories uh, out of 2% and that I guarantee you was what you said. um, You you said, I guarantee you it was far more than 2% of these attacks went wrong. And that was our experience too. We'd go to villages and everybody had a story. Yeah, and it's a lot of times we like to downplay those stories, you know, especially when we first got there, like, oh, they're lying, right? We, We always imputed ill motives. We always gave ourselves the benefit of the doubt in ways that were, frankly, in a retrospect, shameful and criminal in terms of looking at a grainy picture feed and seeing a bunch of people carrying a tube at night uh, and weapons and thinking, well, they're here to mortar me. I must kill them and finding out, well, that's when they hunted and they carried birds in the tubes. Uh, But we always gave ourselves the benefit of the doubt. And then there was a great irony, I guess. a sick irony in terms of a lot of the way we would initially interact with these is you'd go and have a meeting, one of those you filmed in the province I was in uh, during that time. Uh, you'd go have a meeting, you'd hand a couple a stack of thousands of Afghanis. Uh, maybe you'd, you know, literally, we'd sometimes, you know, bring a goat, buy some livestock for them. And then they would nod politely and be quiet. And <clears throat> ironically, we took the worst interpretation of that, was we said they don't care about lives. Mm. Because they weren't immediately angry, we took the worst interpretation of saying, well, they, they just don't care. People die in Afghanistan all the time. They're happy with a goat. Uh, and you know, a great reporting and a great book that I'd encourage you all to read by Wesley Morgan, uh, who kind of followed the battle in the Peshawar River Valley over time. I, obviously, that's stupid. Obviously, it's arrogant. Obviously, it's m- more than a little bit racist and culturally ignorant in how we interpreted that. Because it doesn't matter if it's just one, two, three. If somebody kills a member of my family illegally or unjustly, I don't forget it. I might nod politely when a bunch of people carrying weapons are standing in front of me, uh, but I'm not going to forget it. And that accumulates over time. 
uh, and it leads to looking the other way when, hey, your cousin has joined the Taliban, you're not going to turn him in. You're like, hey, okay, get one for us. You know, it's, it's, we interpret it in all the, the worst possible ways to our own detriment. To say, well, not the worst, the worst of it was the Afghans who had to suffer under it. Yeah, just a quick point, and that is that you know the Taliban weren't running around with uh, epaulets that identified them as the Taliban, and there was this tendency to um, to think that we had killed a bunch of Taliban when we had killed a lot of civilians, because there was no there was no clear demarcation. Uh, so, you know, you'd hit a village and you'd kill. Uh, 30 men, and we would just declare them all to be Taliban. Mm -hmm. Always gave ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. Always gave ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. A Ambassador Rahmani, what, what is your take on, on civilian deaths in this war? Um, I will start uh, with uh, what you started uh, with, and you said that uh, there is no way to count or report uh, people dying in Afghanistan. There is no way to count and report people living in Afghanistan either. Uh, it has uh, just been a country so devastated by war and tragedies and whatnot that unfortunately our lives, Afghan's lives, have become a very cheap stop for all parties. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, I agree that, that those people were not very forgiving in terms of what happened to them. And it happened to all of them, many of them, all the, all the people that they knew each other. I want to add another quote to this also, that uh, very often, uh, when, uh, during all the time that I was engaged with the government, one of the things that I was continuously receiving in terms of reports from our own military was that how people in the villages were forced to send one son to the Taliban if they send one uh, son to the uh, Afghan army or Afghan military. So uh, in order to balance, in order to be, uh, to be able to live where they were living. So uh, and, uh, I knew and I had seen mothers, met mothers, who had lost uh, her sons. Uh, two of them went to the Taliban uh, fighting the other side and one uh, to the uh, who was working with the Afghan military for, and, and killed by the Taliban. So that definition of peace was lost. And that matters. Like when, when this, this idea of, oh, let's uh, find a way to uh, resettle and, um, and find the settlement with, with completely not thinking about justice, about what had gone wrong, and not even stopping it. The, the, the kidnapping campaign, the killing campaign was at its highest when the, the, the Doha talks were going on by the Taliban. The Taliban were targeting and killing people at, at the highest rate at the, at the, at that, uh, in those years, and increasingly so. Uh, so, uh, well, yes, civilian casualty did, did play a, a huge role, not only in uh, encouraging people to maybe um, look away uh, when their cousin was joining uh, the, the Taliban forces, but also that, that internalized sense of grievances and anger. Uh, that that uh, is embedded in them. Now, what I hear from the ground is a lot of people are jo joining I uh, ISIL for what happened to them. Uh, now that there is not much reporting, we don't hear how many people are on daily basis getting captured and killed by the Taliban because of being in the wrong side, wrong ethnic ethnicity, mm -hmm. speaking the wrong language and whatnot. So that the, the, those things are really deepening and unfortunately continues to be. But yes, that, that was a huge factor and totally overlooked, totally downplayed. Yeah. I want to go back to this point that was raised by you, but also in the film. I believe it was uh, General Sami Sadat, who was a commander of the Afghan Air Force. And you know, he described essentially how dependent the Afghan army was on American airstrikes, air support, and in particular, he mentions contractors. That when that mm -hmm. support went away, that the you know, experience of the Afghan forces was very different. Uh, how dependent were, was the Afghan army? I should say, um, you know, General Sadat has been accused of 
carrying out very uh, excessive use of force in places like Helmand Province and in, and, um, in particular of, of incredible amounts of civilian casualties in, in Helmand. Um, but how essential was that to sustaining this government? And what does it tell us that if it was so essential to keeping this government running, and, and the point you brought up earlier about what kinds of equipment and material the Taliban had, what does that say about how this war was sustained for so long and when it was truly unwinnable? It's been unwinnable for a while. And you know, the, the two points, to, just to quickly follow up with what the ambassador said, is you know, the couple of the mistakes we made was one, we didn't have the time or interest in understanding the nuances of Afghan politics and our Afghan enemies. And we quickly, I remember getting to Kunar in 2009 and seeing this hodgepodge, thousands of, not thousands, but dozens of different terrorist groups, all LET, TTP, mm -hmm. and we quickly came tired and said, let's just put it all in one bucket. And let's just call them anti-Afghan forces. Uh, and the Taliban quickly became the equivalent of Al-Qaeda. And one of the things that took a while to understand is when you're talking about the Taliban, as the ambassador mentions, a lot of time that's your cousin. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like, oh, these are evil people coming over the border. Uh, they're inhuman. They must be killed. It's more akin to uh, that crazy uncle you talk to on Facebook that you have to see once a year. You're like, that guy believes in some really crazy shit, but he's still family. Uh, and we never looked at that nuance and said, okay, well, how do we grapple with that? And, oh, by the way, it's not going to be racking up body counts that's going to help us solve that. Mm -hmm. And by 2018, when we had very few Americans there, uh, we dropped more bombs than any other point during the war. So think about that. More than any other time in the war, which means we dropped a lot of bombs. And we had nobody there uh, to follow up on the messaging battle. Nobody there to look and say, well, did this guy just pick up the phone and talk to the wrong person? Was he talking to his cousin? Or was he talking with nefarious purposes? Uh, and if there's nobody but a young Talib there to explain what happened, yeah. that story quickly harms us more so than any advantage we got mm -hmm. through killing somebody. In terms of air, it's just we introduced something uh, almost completely foreign. Again, the Taliban never used a single helicopter in 20 years of war. They did not have aircraft. They had time and patience to work local politics, to talk to the people that needed to be talked to, to lean on the people that needed to be talked to, uh, to slowly influence and win over the countryside. Whereas what we wanted to do was take special forces, which usually were Tajik, they were Northerners, often did not speak Pashtun, and we would drop them into these remote areas to do kill capture operations in the same mode as us, which often meant that they would make the same mistakes that we would, uh, and then we would pick them up and fly around. And we pretended that that was security. And really, it was just the Taliban's unwillingness or inability to mass because they knew they'd get bombed. Uh, but it was a completely artificial construct that allowed us to overlook the fact that the army itself was a house of cards that could not survive in the way that we had built it and deployed it, and that the way we were supplying that military and running it was also divorced from Afghan politics. Mm -hmm. And the idea that somehow it would just miraculously survive on its own one day is one of the greatest delusions we've ever engaged in. You bring up the, the, the sort of a peak of bombs dropped. And in 2019, we dropped more bombs in Afghanistan than any previous year of the war. And that same year, there was the least media coverage in the United States of that war, of any year. Um, and not long after that, this deal is struck. And I, I want to go to you, Ambassador Rahmani, because you bring up the refrain you were constantly hearing, that there are four parts to this, and no part is final until all parts are agreed upon. What were you making of that at the time? first of all, and second of all, if you could go back in time to when this was happening, what would you do differently? Well, first of all, uh, what I, I was making out of the uh, four parts and that thing would be agreed until all is agreed, uh, for just the sake of inevitable situation, that I, like many others, were 
was I was seeking hope in it. I was seeking hope that this four parts would at least bring some kind of don't messy, but a settlement that would end the war that was responsible for so much bloodshed one way or the other, but then at the same time would not be a handover of Afghanistan and the silver plate to the Taliban, the way it did happen. So that, that was what I was making and hoping. But nevertheless, looking at the agreement, there were very subtle major things that were lost. In a lot of these meetings, I was the only woman that was present. When, for example, the agreement was coming to an end and there was a presentation of it to the Afghan government, the, the lack of ever mentioning women was very alarming, seriously alarming. And I, I, of course, I had asked that question. The response was, it is for Afghans to decide. And of, uh, it, it, that was, again, extremely alarming. So what would I have done differently? I mean, during that very year that you mentioned, in 2019, I was uh, in the United States. Uh, it was an extremely difficult year. Uh, I tried everything I could to convince people to look at this differently, not to but by the time I arrived in the US, what I found was Afghanistan was such a tired story that other than the veterans and some particular groups, there were not a lot of people who had much interest in it. The uh, media was, the media coverage had, was going down. Uh, the number of organizations that were active uh, were less active. But most importantly, if there was any other idea than just attacking and killing the Taliban, which was already discussed, that the, even that was not fully resourced, fully uh, 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 thought out. If there was anything else, and there was obviously because there were billions of dollars uh, sent and spent and wasted, then why there wasn't any single U.S. company investing in Afghanistan? Why there was any uh, ma major infrastructures being built, given how, uh, how much money that we spent? Those, all of those different things were adding up to the grievances to the distance of the people at the local level, at the villages, at the provinces, from the central government that was continuously by day shrinking, both in terms of its popularity, its reach, and the trust of people in it for the right reasons. So that, that, that dilemma, all of that contributed to one another. I mean, going back there, what, what we have, what, I would have done differently. Maybe, maybe all I could have done is try to find ways and, and secure, a, at least to the extent possible, some ways for the Afghan women and Afghan girls uh, to 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 secure themselves uh, in in a better way that that they would not experience what I was experiencing when I was a teenager, hmm. not being allowed to go to school. You bring up this inevitability that, that, that was felt around this time, and I want to I focus a little bit on, I, I think it was uh, Steve Call who in the film said that there was no legal or political reason that this withdrawal had to happen. It was a question of what would the Taliban do to the United States if we did not hold up this deal that Biden's predecessor had made. What, what would the Taliban have done, Colonel Dempsey? If what? What would the Taliban have done? If, if, if President Biden <clears throat> had not held to the deal that was struck. Well, there's an interesting uh, one. You'll find a lot of people trying to do a quick two-step around um, American casualties and sustainability. Because mm -hmm. the one thing that the Taliban did adhere to out of that agreement was mm -hmm. not to attack American forces. Uh, and so disingenuously, you would hear a lot of generals uh, and pundits still say, well, we weren't taking any casualties. How come we didn't keep 5,000 people there? 
Um, and so the question is, had that then been withdrawn, uh, one, the Taliban would have began attacking us again, and then we would have ramped up bombing again, uh, and we would have continued perpetuating this self-licking ice cream cone of violence and death that was not doing a damn thing uh, to bring about a sustainable, peaceful Afghanistan. Martin, do you want to add? Well, I would just say by that time, 2019, I'm sorry uh, to say, I think the whole project was lost. Um, and the way in which uh, Halilzad negotiated in Doha just uh, ensured that it was a, a lost cause. Everybody had given up. The American public had given up. Uh, Trump played into that, as we, as we report. Uh, by 2019, I don't know if you could have pulled our fat out of the fire at that point or saved. I mean, I, I don't see why the Taliban had any reason to concede any kind of um, rights to women by that time. Um, I agree with, with Doug Lute that the, the fuse was um, lit 15, 20 years earlier. And by that time, really, it was hard to convince Americans why we were there. Um, the idea was to go in initially and take out Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. Uh, we did that. They were in Pakistan, interestingly. Um, and, you know, after that, we wandered into this kind of uh, nation-building uh, project um, with a corrupt central government. Uh, it was impossible to build institutions. I just, you know, to my mind, uh, this was an unwinnable war from very early on. And, I, and I'm sorry to say, great expectations were raised and progress was made, especially in the case of women. And it's, it's a, a, a horrible um, tragedy what has transpired. Um, but you know, we, we all collectively as Americans have a responsibility for setting up these expectations and then quickly changing our minds and dashing them. Yeah. Ambassador Rahmani, do you want to respond? Yes, um, I understand many of the points that are being raised, but I am of the mind that it was not an unwinnable war. First of all, as I started out, the, I think the definition of war was confused and lost for the international community, the United States, at the outset, uh, mostly more than it was for uh, others. For, uh, for Af Afghans wanted a very, uh, they wanted a good life. They wanted opportunities. They, 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 they wanted to, uh, uh, they wanted progress. They did. Uh, of course, well, the, 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 the uh, government played it their part uh, and how they were, uh, were they responsible? Absolutely, yes. Uh, that, that there is no question about that. And, and, and in, in my view, they, they carry a, a the biggest share of blame uh, in, in all of this. But I, I believe that it was winnable. It was winnable because of the will of the people. After, between 2001 and 2003, Taliban were just trying to find a way to be safe and, hi and, and hide and, and reintegrate to their villages. There wasn't much of an idea of regrouping. All of that happened immediately after, after the, all of the resources and attention got diverted to Iraq. Then the support from region, so, uh, of course the role of uh, Pakistan we already spoke about. So moving forward, um, they should there have been more attention in terms of institution building, in terms of um, I don't even want to call it nation building because, of course, nations should be built by the people of the nation, not, not by outsiders. But if this was genuinely complemented by economic support growth, things would have been different. I, ha I, in, I had seen it, I had experienced it. People who had opportunities for employment, for growth, for uh, education, they were grabbing it. There were some changes that you were witnessing that never happened in the history of Afghanistan. The, the progress that women made was not just a bubble in a few cities. It was also 
part of a shift in the mindsets. A lot of the women who were allowed to travel, to come from their provinces, to stay in the dorms, was a very new phenomena in the history of this country. And, and much more that I don't uh, want to take up uh, a lot of time. I think the, 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 the war was winnable if, if it was defined in a way that was not about, let's see how many we kill and how when we get um, tired and then uh, what, what is next. In fact, uh, one of the colleagues, uh, I'm, I'm quoting somebody uh, that uh, used to say that, that in 20 years of war, uh, we fought 21 year wars because every single year of war there was a different strategy the whole um, cohort of the troops would, would shift the diplomats had to uh, only stay there for one year just by the time they had learned a little bit about the country they, they, it was time for rotation and so forth so I, I, I think in, from what I had seen it, it was very very possible to win because you had the support of the people so we're hearing very. I, I just want to uh, say that um, I, I started my answer by saying in, by 2019, I think the war was unwinnable. Um, and I think it's interesting, Ambassador, that you take it back to 2001, 2, 3, as to where uh, major mistakes were made. And of course, the Iraq war, where resources went out of the country. And I think, um, and we do look at that in, in episode one of the series, that there were opportunities then. Um, and that was the beginning of um, the whole thing going off the rails. I'm, I'm still not sure even had um, uh, those uh, days have been played better uh, if we could have succeeded. But uh, certainly I think it's interesting to go back to that period and examine just what the decisions were at that time. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of disagreement, I think, about at what point this happened. But I, I don't hear a lot of disagreement around the fact that the withdrawal itself was bungled, that this was an epic failure you know, with, that reminds so many of Vietnam. Um, and I want to just kind of drill down on that. It's, it's clear that the Biden, nobody from the Biden, from the Biden administration would sit down for um, a discussion about this withdrawal and and in the time since you know we've seen very limited answers to questions what kind of accountability should there be for that and where should that be coming from I don't think you can excuse the military in this uh, and I think we carry much of the blame uh, you know it's funny a lot of the generals uh, former ISAF commanders said well we never really knew you know what what the policy was or what the president wanted to do despite the fact that since 2010, every single president said, I want out. And what happened was you'd see guys like Joe Dunford take off the uniform, walk over to be a Raytheon board member, but then he'd put his retired general hat on and he would lobby the president of Congress. Everybody said, no, 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 keep going, we can win this. And so the military kept getting extensions, mm -hmm. kept getting extensions, despite the fact that the president wanted to go. And that redounded down to the level of the current commanders. Right? One of the things the military leaders bitch about the most about the months leading up to the collapse <clears throat> was that Ghani had the temerity to want to replace military commanders. Think about that. We're angry at the president of a sovereign nation for wanting to ensure that he controlled his own military. And we're saying that somehow that was unexpected or a moral failing on his part, that he would look at this thing that the American military built and these commanders that the American military helped select and say, you know what, I'm not sure I can trust these guys. I'm not sure I can fight with these guys. And I lay that directly at the feet of Scotty Miller, hmm. who knew he had, under President Trump, wanted to get out. President Biden said he wanted to get out. But every single American commander said, you know what, it's easiest to stick with the plan we got. Let's keep propping up this military, and let's just hope that our retired cohort will get us an extension on the play versus any actual introspection or any of the hard decisions that say, you know what? Maybe we need to let this military fragment while we're here 
Maybe we need to let Ghani put his own commanders in and get them out. We'll support them with air and do what we can, but let him build a force organic to Afghanistan that wants to fight for political leaders in Afghanistan and not at the behest or under the tutelage, patronage, and oversight of the American military. Uh, I mean, the morale was um, in the toilet um, by 2015, and they were losing one-third of all recruits um, every year, and they'd have to replace them because these guys were coming out of their villages, getting a paycheck, not a very good one, but they're getting a paycheck, uh, going to fight, and then once they had a little bit of money in their pocket, they would go back home. Uh, there was not the kind of commitment, um, you know, the, the Taliban, whatever you think of them, were a force with a tremendous amount of legitimacy in the south and east of Afghanistan. And all you have to do is ask Vladimir Putin what it's like to go into a foreign country and try to defeat an indigenous force of people who believe this is their country. The Afghan forces did need to be radically rebuilt. Um, but that's, you know, building the airplane, as the, as the saying goes, in mid-flight. It was... a uh, it was a heavy lift. They, they were the morale, as I said, was just really low, and it, it was a it, it was a problem that had festered for uh, too many years. Uh, by the time Ghani comes into office, um, as I say, it, w it was a big project. Mm -hmm. And Ambassador Rahmani, in terms of accountability now, and thinking about what, especially what young women and girls have lost. Where does accountability lay, and what would you like to see done? Well, when it comes to blame, I think there is enough of it, and everybody can get their share. Uh, I don't want to dwell too much about that. But as an Afghan, I, I do uh, uh, put uh, a lot of responsibility, if not most of it, but a lot of it, uh, or, uh, on, on, the, on Afghans themselves, on ourselves. Uh, on, on the leadership, on how we handle things uh, on all sides. And when I'm talking we, it doesn't mean the Afghan government, uh, every single Afghan, uh, one way or another, involved. Uh, we failed collectively uh, as a nation. And uh, it, it has been uh, bad and tough. Um, Yes, and, and the people who are paying the price are the poorest, most vulnerable, uh, women and children uh, are at the forefront of this, uh, and now the, the, the front of the war has uh, shifted facing women at this point. Um, so what can be done is the main question, and there is a lot that can be done. Unfortunately, what I continuously see is a, a, a huge tendency uh, for uh, uh, totally ignoring and disengaging. In addition to the fact that it is a tired story, it's also a story that people do not want to hear about it. It's, it's a sore spot. And uh, now there is there's, uh, many more newer issues, uh, sexier uh, crises that everybody is uh, getting, unfortunately, uh, very preoccupied uh, with. Um, uh, so uh, to do anything, you really need to, first of all, recognize that repeating the policies that did not yield the uh, desirable outcome is not going to yield uh, that uh, if we repeat it, uh, number one. Number two, uh, so long as Afghanistan is continuously and only seen either as a security issue, as a security threat, or a charity basket. There is nothing much that can be done. That, that view, that mindset needs to shift. And if there is any willingness to shift that, then again, uh, I am saying the people of Afghanistan is, is the, the uh, biggest asset that was built over, over the past two decades, uh, the young population who are hungry for education, for opportunities, and they simply want a good, peaceful, normal life. Uh, they, they are the assets and, and investment on them and opportunities on infrastructure, on ways to 
engage in uh, to empower people uh, would be the way out. Okay, and um, in terms of accountability in the United States, learning lessons from this war, there are war commissions. Uh, there are supposed to be there's supposed to be critical examination of what went wrong, and, and ideally, you know, this can help inform future wars. What are your what is your outlook on the likelihood of us really drawing real lessons uh, for the United States? My fear here goes back to one of my initial comments, which is about <clears throat> what led us here was the distance between America and its military, uh, in a way that manifests very counterproductively. You know, um, most of us aren't asked to engage uh, with the war in Afghanistan. Most of we're not asked to pay war taxes. There's no chance of a draft. Um, and so people use that as an excuse to abdicate their responsibility as citizens. Uh, and your responsibility as a citizen is not to thank the troops for their service. Your responsibility as citizens is to ask the hard questions of the generals and politicians who put them in harm's way. But my fear is that, well, we must respect the military, is what you're going to see in the partisan maneuvering on Capitol Hill and in all these debates. Everybody's going to say, well, put the military aside. The military, of course, did nothing wrong. Uh, it was all Biden. It was all Trump. It was all that. The military was the dominant voice in this. It's really hard to name, if you ask most Americans, could they name an ambassador to Afghanistan? I guarantee none of them could. But a good chance, though, they know the names of Petraeus, Nicholson, Miller, and a few of the other commanders that rotated through. We dictated a lot of what happened. We wasted a lot of American taxpayer dollars. More importantly, we wasted a lot of American lives for something that really didn't have much chance of success and that would be laughed at if looked at objectively. But we're in a unique situation in America where if somebody in a uniform stands up and says, sure, I can go do this, they say, well, that's the military. Sure. They got it. They're supposed to be this uber-competent, great force. The only way you have a great force is with oversight and accountability. And so uh, I'm oh. not sure it'll happen, but God, I hope some people are willing to really take uh, American military leadership to task about what we did. But where does that, that come from in an age in which we don't have a draft when Americans <clears throat> Are not we borrowed a great deal for these wars? It wasn't necessarily always taxed. Mm -hmm. um, when Americans aren't feeling the costs of these wars personally, right? Yeah. Especially when we've now shifted to a form of warfare in which we're not sending as many troops on the ground. We're conducting this largely via air support and partner forces. Like, what is that bit of leverage left to do what you're calling for? It's tough. I don't know the answer, right? Because. Um, you know, it's the old adage, it's easy to be stupid when you're rich. Uh, and we're a very rich nation. And we don't have, the average American does not have the incentive uh, to look at what the military is doing. Uh, you're not hitting the pocketbook, not yet. Um, but as we uh, get more and more, you know, as we struggle with our economy, uh, I hope people can put some of that in context and say, how did we spend that money and where... Did we miss opportunities to either not just spend at home, but maybe to spend more intelligently overseas? And you know, it's it's the old adage. I, I uh, you know, we say it all the times. But if it's not a common knowledge among the American public, I hope you know that the American military has more people employed to play in bands than we have foreign service officers. The imbalance between defense and state is so incredibly large that our foreign policy uh, is the worship of this one big giant golden hammer that can solve everything. And if we can't solve it easily, we just don't want to pay attention to it. It must be a problem. You know, we, we've got this great, beautiful hammer. We want to use it. We don't have the patience or the nuance to say, well, maybe there's other ways to solve international problems. Mm -hmm. Martin, this, this film is it's the body of 20 years of work. It's, it tells us so much about America's war in Afghanistan, but also its, its makings in the world and you know, how it goes about executing foreign policy. What, for you, is have, having made this, and I really encourage those of you who haven't seen parts one and two to please do so. It's incredibly powerful. But what are some of the takeaways for you? Um, 
just quickly to address the question you were just talking about, which is a, mm -hmm. a huge one. It takes political leadership mm -hmm. to overrule uh, the Pentagon. And throughout, in the making of the film, we saw over and over again how the Pentagon uh, made the arguments that carried the day. In the White House, uh, around the, in the Situation Room, uh, they even pulled the plug on negotiations that were starting up early on. Um, so, I mean, that, and that was one of the big lessons that the military, you know, we, we love the military. We make movies about them. We love their capability. Um, it's all Top Gun and, you know, now there's a movie, The Covenant, about uh, another <laughs> Afghan adventure, and I'm sure the military probably comes out looking pretty good. Um, it, it's going to take real political leadership and a strong hand uh, as you say, I mean, that's a great example. There's more, you know, tuba players than there are um, ambassadors. Uh, that has to be turned on its head. Okay. Well, thank you, Ambassador Rahmani. Thank you, Martin, for making this film. Thank you, Colonel Dempsey, for being here. This, is, this has been an incredible conversation, and, and I really appreciate all of you taking the time to, to be so thoughtful here. So let's keep the moment.